Aloha mai kako, everyone. Mahalo nui for joining us. It is so nice to see so many beautiful faces from near and far. Many of you um, who know James um, from working with him in the past, and some of you have met him via Zoom uh, in our community uh, conversations. And um, it's just really special for all of us to be joining together here. Um, and I'm so excited to, in a way, share James with you if you don't know him, because for the past year, he's been our little, uh, not so secret artist in residence, but um, we're just very excited to, um, to share him with you, with everyone else, uh, because he's just a wonderful human. Uh, our team has had the privilege and honor to work with James over the past year. Um, right at the start of the pandemic. Um, and he is our first digital artist in residence at the mill. And um, in a time where we could and often did feel isolated, um, it was it was a pu'uhonua for me to have these uh, week, meetings every two weeks uh, to connect with um, such a thoughtful and inspiring artist all the way in Singapore and he has taught us all so much and um, you know with the deep relationships that he has built in communities on Molokai, um, in Okinawa, in other parts of Japan and um, in Singapore you know with these communities that are so focused on taking care of their land and um, aloha aina practices um, to honor their kupuna um, we are humbled to further connect our community uh, with and broaden that community um, to create this participatory space for sharing stories um, and methods of love for water and land. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, James, um, pleasure to see you all. Um, good evening. Aloha in Hawaii. Good morning here in Singapore and Japan. And, um, so this is a part of a guide to loving water. You are also a participant. Um, every part of this, this day will, will continue to grow. So the first question, one question we have is what does water say and what will it teach us? This is a question that we're still thinking about now and we've been thinking about over the last year together. Today is our second activation. Uh, the first was a closed door blessing with Kubu. Um, that started off the exhibit last week. This is an artist talk together with Mina. Um, at any point, she'll question or interject and share stories that relate um, together, please. Um, and we'll have time for questions and then open participation also for all of you that are on Big Island. Please do come and be, be a part of the, the handmade okay sheets that are being drawn on. Or for those of you that are in Singapore, I have a few in my studio, so we're drawing on them one by one. First thing uh, is just a brief acknowledgement uh, of this project, as well as all of the projects I'll talk about today would never be possible alone. Um, so Kumu Keala, Mina, Miho, Setsuko, Hiroki, Gerald, Chris, YQ, Gabe, Angia, uh, have made a huge difference with this A Guide to Loving Water project. And there's many others that I'm also forgetting, so I really apologize. Um, but please just know that you're all very uh, graciously appreciated. Um, particularly at a distance, it's become really clear that we all depend on others um, to get things done. Um, the rest, also amazing people here um, who helped with the Molokai window, as well as the Seabirth, the other two projects that I'll discuss today. Um, so just a brief moment for them. I'm not going to read every single name, but please just acknowledge each of them from the depths of my heart. Um, starting with Big Island, uh, very early on in our conversations when uh, Miho and Mina first said, hey, digital artists in residence, I had no idea what that was, but sounded interesting very early on one of the um, conversations we had uh, Shingo Honda came up um, I had met him and worked with him on the Mono Hasho back in 2012 and interviewed him um, and 
they told me the unfortunate news that he had actually just recently passed away. Um, so it was very personal and very emotional, but it was also, um, it felt really like it was meant to happen in that way, I, that I was to hear it directly from, from Miho and to remember his spirit. So I want to give a brief tribute to him um, before we start the artist talk. This is one of his artworks, um, which is about two pieces of wood and a rope that's binding them together. Um, and what he said about this piece, he often said, it's not one, it's not two, what is it? Um, which is also a, a Buddhist parable about two, you know, non-binary, non-single. So you think about yourself too. Am I, am I one? Am I two? Am I, what am I? You know, is also the question that this artwork poses. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful piece that's underappreciated and he's never recreated. He's against recreation of artwork. So he actually um, wasn't included in the exhibition that we held uh, because he believed that all things were ephemeral and that artworks only exist at the time when they're made, not 30 years later. Um, so his spirit of uh, impermanence and really enjoying the moment, I hope that is, I feel that he's here with us today. Um, very briefly, just a, a couple of short quotes by him in an interview we did together. Um, you can read them your, yourself, I think is, is best, but... Are these big enough? Can you read these? Is it okay? Yeah. Sorry, these are also translated by me. The interview was in Japanese. I forgot to write that. Um, but the very last one here, um, he takes a very unique perspective, not just on monoha, but on life. Um, and so this leads into the first project we're going to discuss as well, but um, his approach of listening. Um, so listening to materials is a very important one. And I know his later works that he's more well known for on Hawaii Island are actually quite different from what I'm showing right now, but um, he got very fascinated with botanics and many other things which are very site specific and he always embodied the place where he was when he was a monk in LA. He also made very different work from Japan and um, you know, on Big Island he responded a lot to the, the tropical um, plants and things, but uh, this listening is something I want to just um, mentioned before we start. So this was a piece he did at Tokyo Metropolitan Museum uh, for the Ningen Tobushitsu Man and Matter exhibition that was held in 1970. And it's the floorboards of the, the exhibition hall in their raw state. Um, and then at nighttime when no visitors were there, he would move these, these uh, blocks so that it would be a different position. Um, and then people would come back so each day that you went to see the piece, it would be slightly different. Different floorboards would be bent up um, and different boards would be down. So it appears kind of like what we take for granted or what's underneath us at all the time, which is just like wood or cement or something that's always there. But his intervention was just to change them ever so slightly so that each day they would be slightly different and be forced to not take the floor for granted and to be aware of your, your environment as well as the materiality of wood and other things. Um, so this is just one piece I wanted to share briefly about how to listen to the earth um, before we start today. You know, anything you want to interject? This is, so now we dive into the artworks themselves. No, I, I think it, I'm, from our conversations too, we've talked about how listening and seeing is an art you know, and, and that perpetual question, oh, what is art? But it's, uh, we can so easily limit ourselves, right? So um, I think that's a beautiful um, introduction to your work and the importance of listening and the power of that. So, um, yeah, but the digital residency, <laughs> we dove in at a time where we weren't sure what, um, what quite was going on, obviously, in the world. But um, prior to that, we have met, we're introduced to um, 
James's work through the inundation exhibition. Um, thanks to the amazing work of the brilliant Jamie Hamilton Ferris um, and learning about his work with communities that was just so inspiring. So um, meeting digitally every two weeks, um, we really got to spend time together and have meaningful conversations um, that I had mentioned, you know, being for me a Pu'uhonua of discovery, exploration, and really for me as a curator questioning what is an exhibition. So I'm extremely grateful for this, for this process and the discussions that we've gotten to have. So, mahalo. So we kept these hui memos on a Google Doc, like many of you were probably doing as well, but um, as a digital record of what we were doing in our weekly and bi-weekly meetings. Um, this was a breakthrough though. So thanks to Setsuko and Gerald, who are amazing, uh, you know, Falke and paper makers. Uh, this was a sample sheet that they mailed to me. And so this is a tracing of my cell phone while looking at the Hui memos while we're talking. Um, and so this tangibility of the smell of paper and ink and earth is something that I think a lot of us were really hungry for during the pandemic. So returning to the paper and allowing it to sort of seep into the digital world felt really meaningful. This was one of the early experiments um, that we did together. So now we're gonna jump into three previous projects and then talk, return to a guide to loving water. Um, at the end. And so, Mina, do you want to maybe, this is, this is kind of, we selected these together, um, these three different projects. Anything about, so the first one's Yame, Ge no Gakko, Art and Agriculture School in Yame, Fukuoka. Sorry. No, I mean, um, when we were introducing ourselves to, you know, getting to know James and he showed us these videos, um, it was just amazing projects of, of listening and, and um, uh, creating these, these opportunities for people to, to connect as part of the, of the listening. Um, so yeah, mahalo for, for sharing, I'm, I'm excited, yeah. So the first thing that I did there with the community, uh, Yame means eight women. Um, so I thought it was very simple just to respond to the name of the, the town um, and interview eight women about basically life, what they're feeling currently, what their situation is. Some of them were from Yame, some were not. Um, and so this work was titled Eight Layers of Dirt and it was in an abandoned campground. Uh, there was a flood that had happened just before this uh, project began. So each of the women chose the place they wanted to be interviewed and then the sound was um, recorded and played in these eight little campground houses. Um, people were brought on tours. So it was a guided exhibition where you went through a number of different artworks, a number of different food, tea. It's also very famous for Yamecha. Um, it's believed to be one of the first places where tea came through the Buddhist um, migration from China. Um, so you drink tea and, uh, you know, hear different works uh, my works as well as other artists artworks in the town so it was a, it was a, a kind of tour or a guided experience of different oral histories as well as material histories by other artists um, so these are some of the installations and all I did was take out all the windows so that there was no separation between the indoors and outdoors and then install a really nice two-channel installation um, speakers the audio files were played in full. The only parts that were deleted were the parts that the women themselves didn't want to be public. Um, so it was a, a, what do you call that? <laughs> Editing process was, was uh, not uh, extractive. It was kind of delete. We just deleted these short sections that they didn't want people to hear, but the rest we kept in full. So they were hours long. You could never listen to the whole file. So anytime you went into the spaces, you would hear a different section of the tapes. Um, this was one of the tours. It's a beautiful location. It's all being rebuilt right now. So these have all been torn down. Um, 
And the next year was when we started. So this was me as well as a number of other artists, professors, um, and or the Organic Farming Cooperative, uh, San Sanjuku, which started 16 years before us. So that was really the strength in the community was that farming cooperative. Um, but starting in 2017, um, using the old schoolhouse where the cooperative is based, we started something called the Geino Gakko. So Geino would normally refer to theater or performance, uh, but we changed the no, which is also for nogyo uh, or farming. Uh, so it's kind of, we just hijacked the no and switched it into a agriculture and art school rather than a theater school. Um, and so different artists, uh, Mali Wu, as well as other artists. Um, these are some of the lessons that I learned from Ritsuko Taho as well. I won't get into super detail, but Nina mentioned that uh, people would be interested in maybe my methodologies of working with communities. Um, and this is just, so Mali as well as Ritsuko taught me a lot. I feel like if anything, they're the, they're the ones that should be teaching <laughs> artists how to work with communities. They've been doing it for decades. Um, I'm still quite young, but listening, creating spaces, recording interviews in respectful ways, um, and working with diverse organizations, working with existing or um, reviving spaces and places, um, and developing projects slowly without focusing just on end products or exhibitions, but on you know, continuous change. These are just a few observations I made. Um, Wait, JJ, how did you connect with this community? I know that it must happen organically, right? But you must know that this is, okay, this is flowing and this is happening. But yeah, so how did you connect with them? Social Art Lab is a research uh, institute at Kyushu University. So while I was a postdoc there, um, one of the professors who helped to set up the Organic Farming Cooperative is in the ar architecture department. So he was actually involved in not the art part, but the farming part from about 15 or 16 years ago when they were pulling together resources and using the knowledge of how to distribute organic produce and how to kind of how much to package it, how much to keep it raw. Um, he had been involved since the very beginning. So he invited me to just go visit. Um, and that led to a workshop and then kind of annual exhibit. And uh, but I was it was through the through the social art lab, which still exists now as a kind of research institute in Fukuoka city. Well, that's fascinating. And the interviews that you did, obviously trust is such an important element of the process of people sharing with you. Um, um, were there moments where, where, I mean, you, you built the trust through spending time together, um, but um, yeah, that's, incredible to have spent so much time with them you know was was um the trust ever hindering you know what what conversations were had um with community folks did it prevent oh, the conversation? Yeah. yeah definitely i mean if people didn't want to record or didn't want to interview that was always okay um the first one there was a picture in there um and she was a former student an alumni that worked for the farming cooperative um, so we were already meeting a lot and talking just in general about logistics like cooking and who's sleeping where and you know we'd already been in touch a lot with just kind of planning you know when you when you work in a place that is outside of the city you really have to depend on a lot of um, other people's local knowledge so she was she was really helping us a lot um, and so that became a natural extension just to say hey instead of a meeting let's just sit down and talk about your own feelings and then what I did is at the end of each interview just asked if you can think about what we talked about today and then let me know when you think of someone else who, who you might want to introduce. So it took some time but at the end of each interview you know sometimes a few days or a few weeks but that you know uh, first person would introduce the second and likewise um, so that kind of one-to-one -one connection was very strong in all of them. So the, the last woman didn't know the first person, but each person knew the one that was next to them. That was a kind of the way I went about that particular piece. And I will jump. This is a short video of uh, the art and agriculture camp. <laughs> これから 
それぞれの音があります匂いもあります地球の特徴を特徴を感じましょう This is another artist, Koyamada Toru from Jamtai. So he led a workshop that was about building fires and cooking together.、Uh, mine was about listening, as you see here, and walking in rice paddies. So, weeding, what we're doing is weeding out the weeds from the rice. They look very similar, but they're slightly different when you're up close.、So、we're listening to the earth while weeding. に入って濡れた土と触って足、手、どう感じたんでしょうか。最後ここの上にまた戻ってきて自分の場所を見つけて地球とどういうコミュニケーション取れたんでしょうか。し土になっていくとき、死んでいくときはどんな感じなのかなって。このまま土にこう溶けていくっていうか感覚ってどんな感じかなっていうのを初めて感じました、うん、目とか手とかで匂いとかでそのに頼りすぎてるなと思って足でも聞けるんだみたいな,なんかそういう、うん、発見というかなんかいつも自分が使ってるものを頼りすぎてるなというふうに思いました。The rest of the video is、uh, online if you'd like to see the, the rest of it. Molly Wu did a workshop on taste,、uh, and Koya Mata Toru about the hearth.、Um, anyways, this is one, also an amazing book, Wei Su Tung, about、uh, it's incredible about art festivals. But I just wanted to point this last part people globally have felt the need to return to the soil to rediscover a lost sense of belonging. So, this is something she points out in Taiwan.、Um, Particularly artists' residencies and their deeper goals, but she also talks about other precedents. So I highly recommend this Art for Social Change and Cultural Awakening, her second book.、Um, I'm going to go a little quickly through this.、Uh, this is all part of the Art n a g School, but what I did is worked with、uh, stones as you farm. You have to take the stones out in order to keep the soil healthy. So the stones get thrown aside, and these are all stones that are、um, cleaned out of particularly. Rice fields that had been、um, affected by floods.、Um, so, we reused the stones for an exhibition. And then at the end of the exhibition, we did the talks with organic.、Uh, Mohash san is an organic tea farmer as well as a、uh, radio host.、Uh, and at the end, we returned them back and built stone walls to support new farm fields. So, the walls themselves helped to hold back、um, the water inside of the pits. So, they're kind of We recirculated these materials that were in the way and put them in a way that they would help support the farmers rather than distract. This was also, I'm going to run briefly through this、uh, migrating stories, a project about immigration and depopulation.、Um, so we had participants from Vietnam, Hong Kong,、um, and other places, Indonesia,、um, thinking a lot about the, the lack of labor. So in Japan, there's too much land and too few people. Um, so, thinking about how would you invite people, what, we made a guidebook for how to live in the Japanese countryside.、Um, so, a you know, multilingual、um, personal guide for how to farm, how to live, how to do things like go to the doctor and、um, get groceries when there's no grocery store.、Um, so, this was a, a handmade book. How to get a driver's license is the one on the upper left.、Um, you know, some of it very practical advice, some of it personal advice,、um, but thinking much more about Japan. Not as a mono ethnic,、uh, but a multi ethnic society, and thinking about the future, what future would, would hold in terms of you know, population and the countryside and sustainability of food production if, if、um, people from 
all different parts of Asia in particular were welcomed into Japan. Okay, so that, that's that's our first little listening uh, art and ag. So the school still continues, it's still alive now. Um, I don't live in Fukuoka, so I'm not a primary um, organizer, but I'm still an advisor and um, I help support them and recommend other artists, younger artists that continue to do it every year. They did dance and they're continuing this year online. So next, Vina, I think maybe, I don't know, Molokai window, why did you choose this project? <laughs> I mean, I think I, I heard about the project way before I had met you and just was really impressed with the time that um, what came out of such an open ended process and the spiral, which, um, you know, like this project is open ended and continues on marking important moments um, in a natural way, you know, for the Aloha Aina movement on Molokai. Um, I had the opportunity to spend some time on Molokai a few years back. And um, so, I mean, that was personally really special for me as well. Um, but yeah, and I think the love that people have here for land is, is truly a universal um, sentiment. And I, I'm interested in that as well. You know, the, the, the action of Aloha Aina universally is something that connects us all like water like dirt, like soil. Um, and, you know, the more we spend time, and I, this is not a spoiler, but like the more we spend time with it, we, we realize that that's, um, you know, something that connects us, but it's, it's sacred and it's within us as well. So um, I think this project is so special, it's so beautiful. So mahalo for sharing with us. And mahalo for choosing. Um, I'll go a little quickly too, just for the sake of time. Um, but feel free to look at the slides as, as I, I want to explain each one. <laughs> this is a workshop for teachers, um, teaching teachers, and then the, the number of students and the quality of students um, exponentially is just is incredible. This is a Malia's garden, it's just Ainable Molokai Garden, right next to the high school. <clears throat> Uncle Rick and Hey Aloha, um, who lives on Big Island now, um, together drawing. We have this long history on Molokai as being Aloha Aina warriors. You know, we love this place so much that we'll fight for it. Molokai is really the conscience, I think, of Hawaii. The process of making this artwork involves three things. The first thing is listening, both to the earth and to people. So I spend a long time each day with one person talking story. Yeah. It's more protecting the land mm. and trying to figure out how we can live without destroying the only thing that keeps us alive, which yeah. is the land and the water. Mm. So we're going to have to survive. If we don't survive, the whole world is not going to survive. Mm -hmm. Listening to those stories of each person is what feeds into making drawings. Part of it is to heal the land. So you kind of work hand in hand. Heal the land, heal yourself. And as you progress and you start learning about both, you know, that's, that's how you start creating things, you start feeling better. And then that becomes your main focus, that spiritual realm. Sometimes while listening, but usually after a big story that people tell about a place, I ask them to take me to that place. And we go to that place and then I touch the soil and borrow just a very light dusting. And then just drawing on a piece of paper. So that window opens up a color, a texture of that person's story. Literally, the earth beneath our feet. That's a longer video by Matt Dutcher. Welcome to see online. He's also working on a full feature documentary about Uncle Walter that should be coming out hopefully soon. Hello, I know. Um, but yeah, Uncle Bobby, this is his farm who you just saw there briefly. Um, incredible wisdom that he teaches. He also has a wolf program, so people from all over the world come and volunteer on his farm. 
you're conditioning the soil because the soil is you, you've got to take care of yourself. Um, I'm not going to read all of these, but I'm going to flip through them. These are just some brief quotes, um, as well as the place names. Uncle Mac, incredible. Konoviki for the Momomi um, Preserve. This is the process of opening the window. So together with Misty, Apalila, and a number of other uh, local artists from Molokai, as well as um, community college students on Oahu, we painted the window while breathing, similar to what we did in the beginning of this talk today, breathe in and then exhale, share all that wisdom from the ancestors. So each person's stroke you can see is very different, um, even though it's all the same earth sample. There's the exhibition. I'm going to go a little quickly here. This comes from Kaholave when, uh, I mean, the date here is when Uncle Walter told it to me. So all of these are primary quotes of when people told things. Dirt is not dirty. It's just brown. It's a little longer. He says, I love it. Earth Aina is meant to be loved, not bombed. Love, Aloha Aina. And this was a, the Aloha Aina spiral that we made together about, like Mio, uh, Mina mentioned, the positive, successful movements to protect the Aina. All of them have a Molokai connection, but many are pan, you know, archipelagic movements that grew much bigger to all of the other islands. Here's the window. And Malia, our incredible cultural, um, you know, leader for the whole project from beginning up till now. The things she told me still shape everything that I do. The last thing I'll share from her, this is from Malia uh, with Loretta uh, Ritt there, um, saying, see the window, not only with your eyes, but with your heart. Um, the longer part of that quote says, you know, use your spiritual eyes to see the world. So that's, yeah. There you go, the feathers. Some people saw feathers, some people saw all kinds of things in there. But that's Molokai window, just in a snapshot. <laughs> Do we have time for this one, Mina, or should we just jump into, yeah, briefly? This is the reason why we got to know each other. So I guess I'll- Yeah, maybe yeah. just um, show some, some photographs and it will, cool. um, yeah, cool. yeah. その記憶を頼りになんか南を気張るだったような感じがするという話をしてってですね、あのその話を聞きながら自分の経験と場所を探り当てようということで何回かチャレンジしてで新田さんと一緒に戻ったらあったんですよ。This is part one of the triptych based on a historical. Shipwreck that's still unidentified. It's, this is where it's actually located in between Ikibaru and South Ikibaru Island, which spiritually is on the Pacific side of Okinawa. Anyway, I won't get into all of this amazing historical oral history context, but the oral, the local Sonshi is the oral history of the villages uh, about what happened when the boat came and how they peacefully met each other. And so many years later, they continued to send presents. It doesn't say where that was, but it was somewhere far away, probably in Europe. Um, and so they sent gifts back and forth to each other for many years after the shipwreck. This is part two in a historic house, again, working with artifacts as well as video and a painting. So it was in a former residential house with five butsudan. It was a really old house. The Taira family had been there for quite a long time. Uh, but now it's a historic. <laughs> <laughs> 
水はこっちから運んだりね、伊賀から運んだり、ノーミズさ。Okay, keep moving. So, part two is about the 20th century war,、um, violence, as well as love and birth. Part three is how we got to know each other. So, this is curated by Jamie、um, in Honolulu, and the water talks and different events and programming were what led us together、um, with the, the mill. And so, this was an installation view. And unfortunately, this one was too large. To fit in the mill, but we found another wonderful painting that, that fit.、Um, but I just wanted to show both the landscape of Orota as well as the details. So these are signs, some of them are literal signs of protest and protection, but some of them are also signs that I invented based on local community and、um, positive view of yes, is not so often seen on signs, but、um, a lot of these are actual signs. Make music, not us, phrase is also my invention. Um, but yeah, these are all the, the details inside of the painting,、um, all of the different messages for people. Most importantly, ending with Okinawa no Mirai wa Okinawa ga kimeru.、Um, Okinawa chooses its own future. And that's, let's see. Oh, there we go. This is the last thing. So this is the mill、uh, video piece, very short. その町では子供たちがいつもほらほら目を輝かせ風の歌を聴いてるさほらほらの町には武器なんて似合わないほらほら Okay, so the home for Pidama came to the mill as well as the video and that was when inundation happened and then after that Our residency began. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we did a studio visit together and then we did these.、Uh, uh, these are some of our drawings, just briefly on the handmade paper, working with water. And,、um, oh, awesome. Well,、yeah. mahalo, JJ. That was. I, I always love going on that journey, visiting your, your works, because, especially now.、Uh, You know, as the exhibition has opened and we have spent so much time, I can see you know, your prior work differently and, and see how important it is.、Um, at this point, I would like to give,、um, give folks the opportunity to ask questions、um, if they have any.、Um, otherwise, I've, I've got a question, but please don't be shy.、Um, I think it's just. So、what part of what makes your work so special is that the of is the connections that you're making with these communities. So, like I was sharing earlier, you know, to to be a part of your it's much more than a body of work, you know. And in our last one of our last meetings, we we talked about, you know, this is way more than just art, you know.、Um, and it's something that keeps keeps coming back to me,、um, you know, how important it is simply to listen. Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask you about too in this process of acknowledgement, acknowledging、um, alternative, alternative knowledge and different ways of knowing, you know, through this process, you know, that this is not just,、um, it's a very personal process, right? So I was, I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about that process of. Not the process, but your, your thoughts on creating moments where people can connect with these alternative ways of learning. Yeah, thanks a lot、um, for the question. And please, anybody else, too, if you do have questions, feel free to jump in.、Um, Mina and I talk weekly. So we <laughs> questions. Sometimes three. Yeah, sometimes more than a week. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, knowledge and the personal discovery, I mean, for me, they're woven together, like um, kind of like the valke that's behind you there. In order to make paper, it has to be sort of pulled apart and fibers and strands and then pulled back together. So sometimes that happens over a period of like for the Molokai window, it was 10 years, you know, it was like in the beginning, it actually started with a, you know, kind of anger at injustice and the inequity of how, you know, Oahu was trying to use Molokai for electricity and this and that. And, you know, it was also a Singapore developer that was trying to build a whole bunch of resort, you know, homes. And so the kind of the way that Molokai was being treated and then the way that the media misrepresented the local people really, um, you know, incensed me. So that stayed with me for many years before I knew what to do with it. Um, I, I just sent, had a sense of, you know, this being wrong, you know, for, for local people's, you know, incredible self-sufficiency, you know, the sufficiency of food and uh, Hawaiian Molelo language and the schools and, you know, just incredible things going on there. Uh, makahiki festivals, you know, but yet the media focuses on joblessness or this or that, you know. Um, so, and the, the court cases in Oahu focus on the legal details of this and that, you know, whereas the, the, the resilience and strength and um, lessons, you know, like, like Uncle Rick said, Molokai has lessons for the world. Um, so those lessons stayed with me for many years before I knew how to make it into an artwork. Um, and I think with each project, some of them are more personal um, than others. You know, for Sea Birth, it started with a number of different things. One was a diary of my ancestor, James Jack, um, you know, leaving Scotland and reading that, it actually brought up a lot more questions than answers. So I really wanted to know more about those roots and those, you know, the Gaelic language and songs, poetry, the Scottish Renaissance I learned about, uh, the movement, you know, the um, anti-British, you know, very strong wave of anti-colonial since the 1500s that had been going on and particularly in the Highlands and learning a lot more about that through poetry and songs and wondering, you know, why did my ancestors leave there and what happened when they came what happened at the same time that I was also a friend brought me to Okinawa um, and my partner were visiting relatives there and, you know, so there, and we discovered this this shipwreck, you know, through an archaeological uh, sea uh, friend of ours. And so those three things happened all at once, the kind of um, personal wanting to find my own roots, but being in Okinawa and rediscovering that the stories told by Japan are not true about Okinawa as well. So wanting the, the, the smaller stories to be highlighted in a more creative way. Um, I'm not a journalist. I don't make big fancy documentaries or, you know, that's, 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 I, but I do respect a lot of the writing and um, reporting and um, filmmaking that others do. And I rely on it for making, you know, kind of more poetic artistic statements that are really directly made with the people themselves. So every quote, every um, image that gets shown has been shown to the people that are in the piece, you know, many times before it's public. Um, so for me, it's less about the urgency of reporting and it's more important that the people themselves are, are very carefully respected and that it's done in a Pono way so that each step of the editing and the exhibiting or the not, what not to exhibit is actually really important. Um, so selecting sites and selecting scenes and quotes, you know, even re-recording people's interviews because they don't like the way they sound or you know, or they don't want to be represented in a certain way that that community aspect comes through in the process of, the thing, um, of each project. No, oh, that's so, um, I think that it was in the, I hate to say in the world we live in, but the time that you take mm -hmm. to make sure people are represented, like you said, in a Pono way is so mm -hmm. not, it's so atypical. And, um, you know, this straight off was set you apart in my mind of this process that you that you engage with. Um, and also, I think this this idea of alternative knowledge is really interesting because for people who are practiced listening and seeing and really experiencing things in a it's very Kanaka 
And it's ne not necessarily alternative knowledge. It's actually, right, that return to connecting with our, our aina and the waters around us. So um, in the museum and gallery sense, when we talk about alternative ways of, of learning, it's very empowering for cultures who can have the opera for people to have the opportunity to speak for themselves. And I just found that extremely refreshing and powerful um, in the work that you do with the community. So I think that's one thing also Hawaii was very generous in teaching me is that protocols, you know, are necessary. And so, you know, no matter what practices you do, whether it's art or teaching or even business or whatever you do, you know, um, that following protocols um, are, are necessary. And so in some ways it's through, um, through mistakes as well that, that, that we all learn, you know, myself included. So someone mentioning, hey, this is not cool to do right now, or, you know, just having a feeling, you start to get the feeling yourself, but at first it's really other people, you know, Kapuna and, yeah. and other artists and other, you know, cultural practitioners that, that sort of give you tips and say, you know, there's a local filmmaker, um, Hokari in uh, Okinawa, who told me, hey, Kodak, you know, Kodak is a really sacred island, and his, his, his uncles and his, his grandmothers from there, and we would visit there together, and we would never film anything or record anything. And that was just, it wasn't the right time, it wasn't the right place for, for that to happen. Um, right. One time the ship, there was also a kind of a typhoon coming in, we were able to go there, you know, there was kind of just the signs from both nature and from people mm. that tell you if what you're doing is okay. And if it says no, then you, you know, it's really important to listen to that or you're really gonna, you're gonna pay a lot, you know, I think mm. it's gonna be even worse in the end, but that's that's the process that I think everyone can, can integrate, mm. you know, that I think Kanaka, you know, OEV and just a lot of the movements in Hawaii actually have great lessons for other places, how to work respectfully and follow protocols. Yeah. yeah, no. And I think that part of the experience too of, of actually trusting the process and trusting the flow, um, where sometimes you see signs that you really don't want to see, you know, and you have to acknowledge them um, and it, and, and to pivot, you know, and to rearrange yourself. And that one of the experiences for me is that sometimes going with the flow is extremely challenging. <laughs> because we want to buck. We're like, no, my flow is going this way, whether you like it. But no, you have to surrender and trust. And I think that's something that we don't get to practice all the time mm. because in a way our world isn't... Um, can seem like it's not set up for that. Oh. We force things, we we make things work, right? Tim Gunn, make it work. But um, we have to trust, um, trust the process. Mm. But, whoo, Mijo, you've been kind of quiet. You've been on this journey with us. What do you think? You have questions? I was wondering, um, James, if, you know, doing these projects in these different communities, you know, what changes do you, do you see from like the beginning of your project and then at the end after working with the community, are there things that you notice? Yeah, I mean, well, self-transformation is obvious. I mean, I change, but also communities change all the time. Um, someone who's very opposed to a project, you know, four years later um, can become your, one of your biggest advocates and vice versa, but um, you know, people are are mobile and opinions are relative to what others think, you know, so um, I guess weaving is still a good metaphor, but the tension is sort of what holds it together. And when you pull on one string and one particular issue, um, it brings a whole complex, um, you know, web of, of of relations with it. So I, I, I mean, I think of the artworks and myself is actually really small and really like a little drop. Um, Kurosawa Tokiko is a writer during the period between the uh, when Edo was turning into Meiji. 
Um, she called herself like a, a hare in 10 horses. Um, you know, it's like, and it's true, but I mean, she also did really revolutionary things like go to Kyoto with a letter of protest against the, the emperor and things like that. And she, she was very much an actor and agent in history um, through her poetry and her walking and her autonomy. But I think that, yeah, maybe I'm a hare in a hundred horses or something. I mean, there's so many other people and wonderful you know, examples that come from both past and present that, you know, I just hope to maybe stimulate awareness of other hairs or, you know, in these moments we have like this call right now, but, you know, the exhibition and, and all of its kind of ripples. Um, I hope that each one of us find ways to integrate, you know, some of these lessons, um, you know, into our into our own existence and our own communities. You know, that's maybe one, I think one of the big things that we discovered is that through not doing, we're actually doing a lot. You know, together with, you know, Miho, you know, we thought about what, you know, what we can't do, but actually it's allowing us to do a lot of things. So over the last year, reflecting together, you know, on all that is possible when we stay at home or when we, you know, um, do less, you know, as, as, um, humans, what are all the different changes that occur when we when we slow down? You know, that's still ongoing. Anybody else? Questions, comments, anything? Please open. I think uh, Kyoko uh, Setsuko. Oh, there, yeah. Uh, I'm Kyoko. Thank you so much, uh, Jack. Mm -hmm. I found um, the visual as well as the written words that came with the slides that you showed us. Um, it really touched my heart. And art is, you know, it, it's more than art in the sense of art. <laughs> and um, the interconnectivity between ourselves and the earth, you know, uh, uh, people don't realize, but when you, well, part of the realization was when you had us do the meditation and had, had us close our eyes, which I did, and how we connected from our feet to up to our chest and onward. You know, in this busy rush of life, we forget that we are stepping on the earth. And how long has this earth suffered the burden of our feet and beyond our feet, this menage of, um, you know, buildings and <laughs> everything else that we create on top of her. <laughs> and sometimes without any sense of what we're doing to her, and to ourselves. And um, when you took us to Japan and uh, in that little village and seeing the all of you laying on the earth and then walking through the rice paddy fields and getting your feet, I'm gonna start crying <laughs> because it really touched me. And um, we live in this rush to build something else on this planet. And we forget that what we, we are doing is instead of connecting to each other, we're actually causing ourselves to be dispersed from one another. And um, it's about the I society. One little letter I causes so much damage you know, and uh, we don't stop to do exactly what you're doing. And so your art is connecting us in this greater sphere of understanding that we are all in this together on this lovely planet. Are we going to make it last for future generations? And in a, a um, quality of life that actually 
uh, creates us to share with one another and love one another, respect one another. When you turn on the news today, you don't see that. And so I think art and music is a wonderful medium, you know, mm -hmm. and I want to thank you for showing us this, this pathway. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your, your feelings, your emotions. Maybe one last thing. Yes. Just, you mentioned Kumu. I think, you know, one of the things he taught us was to use online media and the devices to love Aina and to love water and learn our place names. So I hope that today has been a part of that, um, to truly use the internet and these devices that we're all on right now as ways of caretaking, you know, to Malama, to take responsibility, to, you know, really engage with each other and with the places that we're in. So I just wanted to share that teaching that, that Kumu taught us that we've really cherished in our weekly um, conversations, as well as I hope to share that with other people to think about how can you learn more about the place you're in, the water that composes your, your own faucet or your own body and your own um, life uh, and share that with others. And so yeah. that's all. Right, so you gotta be that ripple. <laughs> We got to be that here. So mahalo nui for joining us. And we, we look forward to seeing you in person and online. Um, and in the meantime, be well and uh, take care. Yeah. Mahalo. If you'd like to unmute and uh, wave or share your <laughs> aloha and um, love, we'd love to hear your voice. <laughs> mahalo, Jinja. Mahalo. 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 Mahal